Welcome to Data Skeptic All About Surveys, our season about survey design, interpretation, and methodology. Let your voice be heard at survey.dataskeptic.com. The working title for this episode has been Odds and Ends. There's a number of things where either they didn't seem to constitute a full episode, or I just could not find any published research that was relatively contemporary to bring someone on to be the guest. For example, I want to teach you guys about something called the unmatched count technique. I'm very enamored of this idea, but apparently modern journals aren't so enamored of it. There isn't a lot out there I could find. Maybe that's because it's so simple. The purpose of the unmatched count technique is to try and measure something in a survey that people might not want to tell you about. Have you ever cheated on your taxes? Are you addicted to heroin? Did you steal from your employer? Very few people want to self-incriminate. So the unmatched count technique is a survey question that is run in an A-B test. You give half the people one question. For example, please tell me how many of these things you have done in the last 12 months. 1. Taken an international flight. 2. Saw a play or musical in the theater. 3. Went skiing. 4. Purchased a new car. So you should have between 0 and 4 as your number. Then the other 50%, you ask them those same four questions, but then you add, in the last 12 months, have you illegally purchased any pharmaceuticals? Now in both versions of the question, I am a 1. I went skiing, I did none of those other activities in the last 12 months. And if I had illegally purchased pharmaceuticals, saying I was a 2 really isn't particularly incriminating. So you give the opportunity for people to kind of confess something or anonymously give you some information. Then comes the important step, the subtraction. For the first group that saw only four of those options, take the average. Maybe it's 1.7. And if you look at the group that saw the five options, including the pharmaceuticals one, let's say it's 1.9. Now we subtract. 1.9 minus 1.7 is 0.2. That's a measurement of the degree to which that other group, or your population as a whole, presumably, engaged in that one special item that only appeared in one list. And I wouldn't claim this is some perfect technique that doesn't have flaws or attacks that can be done against it, but it is a very neat and clever way to anonymously measure something people might not want to tell you about. Although make sure maybe my list was bad, I was only a one. I think I'd want options where most people would have at least a two or a three, Those were the techniques and things I was hoping I might get a practitioner on to talk about, but maybe some other time. Now let's talk about how to apply our scientific skepticism to the results of surveys. Someone does a survey, it's a measurement, and from there they want to make a claim. Our survey shows that the country is headed towards disaster. Okay, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. The first thing I want to examine is the survey itself. If you can't see the original survey, don't trust it. It is very easy to prime people, sometimes even accidentally, to think a certain way or answer a certain way based on the questions that come before. I've heard some of your own frustrations for times I overlooked the way I designed the surveys we run, had questions that didn't fully apply or presumed missing answers. Now the other, almost certainly more crucial area where we need to apply our skepticism is to the panel itself. Who are these respondents? Where'd you find them? How do you know they're real people? How do you know they're sincere? If you heard our interview last week, you would have learned about some of the procedures the Gallup poll does for their invitation-only panel. You were carefully selected if you get into their group. And there are other organizations similar to that that have similar procedures. Yet at the polar opposite end, there are panel companies that almost exclusively recruit from make-money-fast, get-cash-now-online type ads. And that's why I zero right in on the panel. If a survey result doesn't come from some trusted organization, my skepticism begins with the panel provider. Oh, maybe I should even explain that. In contrast to Gallup that we heard about last week, where they recruit their panelists and then have them take, I guess, the one main survey and there's some follow-up auxiliary type things as well, that's everything in-house. Another possibly more common approach is to divide this up into different companies with different areas of expertise. The group that helps you develop your survey and interpret it might be totally different from the people who are sourcing the respondents that take the survey. And even though I believe in division of labor, 
Rarely does that process work to your advantage as the person conducting the survey. It actually provides a layer of separation between the people you know and whatever process a third party does to get respondents for you. Of course, you can inquire about that, and you'll probably be told about a myriad of different recruitment techniques. The ones you're told about will sound really good. The ones you might not be told about will be the ads that are placed on various banner slots all over the internet saying, get cash now, quick payouts, earn big money taking surveys. Now, in fairness, what else are they to do? But that's the starting point. Come make quick money. Most of those surveys are incentivized. By completing a survey, that person is guaranteed some small amount of money. Generally, they have to get past some threshold before they get a cash out. If someone is paid to take the survey, and in fact paid a very small amount, their incentive isn't necessarily to give you great results and be thoughtful in their answers. If they're trying to maximize profit, they want to take as many surveys as they can. And when software gets involved and you start putting restrictions on people, they can go and make additional accounts. So any survey of this nature absolutely needs some checks and tests in place to measure the quality of that underlying panel. And this should be a two-way street. Any provider who says their system is perfect and doesn't want to give you information probably has something to hide. So what are the things you want to check for? Broadly speaking, it's disingenuous responses. Yet that can come in many forms. A common and easy one to detect is what's called a speeder. All you do is look at the time it took that person to take the survey, compare it to the distribution of everyone who took it. If the average person takes five minutes and someone else is completing it in 30 seconds, that's awfully suspicious. Someone who has sped through the survey often also does another key indicator of fraud. They exhibit a behavior the industry calls straight lining. So imagine a bunch of questions stacked up vertically, and they go straight down in one line, answering A to every question, something along those lines. Now, knowing those techniques, it would be quite easy to develop some sort of script or bot that could slowly take the survey and pick randomly rather than picking always the first choice. All right, someone is now doing the minimum amount of work to defraud me. What can I check for next? There are a variety of test questions you can put in. Here's an example of an attention check. A survey question that reads, on the next question, please select the final answer, which is all of the above. On this one, select false and then give true and false as options. If the respondent doesn't pick false, followed by none of the above, seems like they weren't paying attention. Then there are red herring replies. A common one I always seem to get is, which of these brands are you familiar with? And there are at least one, sometimes it's exactly one, but at least one that's a made-up brand name. And the last type of question and I'm not going to claim credit for this because I can't imagine I invented it, but I did come up with this idea on my own. I'm sure someone thought of it before me. It's what I call the black swan question, or really set of questions. So a major problem you have in the market research industry is that people want that incentive. They want you to pay them to take the survey. But unfortunately, most surveys have some requirement. We only want to survey people who are considering buying electric vehicles. So the survey begins, are you in the market for an electric vehicle? If you say yes, you get to take the survey. If you say no, you're kicked out, and they don't pay you. It's kind of crazy. So I learned this lesson when I saw the Ghostbusters in theater many years ago. You know, if someone asks you if you are a god, you say yes. So I'm certainly in the market for an EV. I also own a yacht. I plan to retire this year. I'm curious to learn about timeshares. Whatever it is, I say yes, yes, yes enthusiastically. Medical fraud is some of the worst. Do you or anyone you know have mesothelioma? For a lot of rare conditions, the answer is going to be no, statistically. People will say yes to earn the $5, and that's going to pollute medical research. Now, of course, people do fit niche demographics, and those niches are often the people you want to survey. But one person shouldn't be in too many niches at the same time. So you ask a lot of broad, separate questions and look for a pattern of someone who's just a little bit too affirmative in everything. And those are all things about questions in the survey. Of course, there's tremendous amounts of opportunity to look at metadata, like IP addresses, whether or not the traffic's coming from a VPN. There are clever ways of using JavaScript fingerprinting. And all these things in concert should be collected through the process and used to eliminate some of the respondents. In my opinion, this should be looked at as a healthy and normal part of the procedure. If your panel provider says, we got to the end and all the responses are great and legitimate and perfect, 
you're going to need to do a lot more of your own analysis. Well, for the last segment, let's move on to the fun stuff, how to interpret your survey results. Let's assume you've already filtered out, as best you can, all of the disingenuous respondents. Or maybe you didn't have to. If you have a good source like an alumni group or a professional organization, I'm not paranoid. <laughs> I'm just concerned about anonymous responses given over the internet, often by bots. But presuming you conducted a good survey and you got a good panel in place, it's time to do survey analysis and interpretation. Oh, actually, one more thing before we get into that, the end size. How many respondents do we need for this survey? This is a common area of gross misunderstanding that I observed often in the market research industry. You cannot know in advance what end size you need. Anyone who tells you that doesn't understand statistics. The end size you need depends on several factors, the most important one being what you are trying to measure. If you want to measure if a coin is a 50-50 fair coin or not, you can arrive at a conclusion with a great deal of confidence pretty quickly. What about measuring the percentage of people in your population who are left-handed? It's estimated that 10 to 15 percent of people are left-handed, but for you to measure that and get a confidence interval that's decent is going to take a lot more sampling than the coin toss example. The rarer a group you want to measure, the bigger your sample needs to be. All right, everybody, today's podcast was supported by the University of San Francisco and their new Master's in Applied Economics degree. So if you're considering grad school and you're interested in data science, let me tell you a little bit more about why an applied economics degree could be the way to go. In the new digital economy, everything is about the platform. As you may know, I wasn't an economics major myself, but I did take a lot of econ classes and I gained a strong appreciation for econometrics and that benefited me greatly in my career. For example, my understanding of the Vickery auction helped me to work in search engine marketing since at least at the time that was the primary auction mechanism of the platforms. And as the digital economy grows and evolves, I've been excited to participate in projects related to tracking of reputation, online experience, and causal inference. And those are just some of the tools businesses are using to make decisions today. Not to be outdone, the University of San Francisco's new Master's in Applied Economics degree is also going to teach you machine learning using R and Python. This is a STEM-designated program, which I appreciate very much. You can get an application fee waiver by visiting this link, usfca.edu slash skeptic. Once more, from the University of San Francisco in California, usfca.edu slash skeptic. Are you a software engineer looking to make an impact with one of the world's premier data and technology companies? Well, you should look into Bloomberg. Bloomberg is building the world's most trusted information network for financial professionals. And right now, they're looking for engineers to join them. You know, for me, there's two critical features when I would consider a new role. Impact first, job security second. Well, in terms of job security, you can look up Bloomberg and see how long they've been around. But more importantly, in terms of impact, you'll be part of a team that builds and delivers tools to help the world's leading business and financial decision makers surface relevant information in an ever-changing ocean of data so that they can act quickly on it. I once had a job where after completing a really big project that would do fraud detection and elimination in our system, the CFO blocked the project because he was worried it was going to hurt our cost of goods sold. So my solution went on the shelf and the company I worked at continued to defraud its customers. I didn't stay much longer, and the company isn't around today. It was a sad outcome when a really cool solution went on the shelf. But if I had worked at Bloomberg, that wouldn't have been a problem. Their software engineers build solutions that are relied on by more than 350,000 financial professionals all around the world, using them to make critical business decisions. Bloomberg believes in using the right tool for the job. Their stack includes C++, JavaScript, TypeScript, and Python, all languages I love. The company is committed to building a diverse workforce full of fresh perspectives. Finding your new career can be hard, but if you find the right company, it can be rewarding and fun. So if you're in the market or just thinking about what your next move might be, learn more about this opportunity by visiting Bloomberg.com careers. That's Bloomberg.com careers. Now, another key factor you'll need to consider is what sort of testing or analysis do you want to do on the data? And now, before I go all ivory tower, 
I am all for a random fishing expedition. Go conduct a survey, ask a bunch of questions, look through the data, cross-tab it 10,000 different ways, and see what the data tells you. But if it took you 900 cross-tabs to find something that was novel and interesting, you're probably just torturing your data to death. Technically speaking, you should do something like the Bonferroni correction or apply false discovery rates. But even stuff like that might be a bit overpowered for just looking at how your survey results break out across a couple of different variables. Perhaps you're surveying a professional group and you want to cross-tab against Democrat or Republican. Or maybe you want to cross-tab against state or region. If the phenomenon you're measuring is strongly pronounced in the data, that's not going to be a problem. For example, what state you live in and your political alignment are highly correlated. Not predictive, but I would have no shame in looking at both analyses and doing so as if they were independent trials. Slice and dice the data whatever way you want, but be very careful in how you present your interpretation to your stakeholders. And this is one of those cases where the data is not enough. It doesn't always speak for itself. Let's say there's one particular survey question you want to delve into and you want to cross-tab it against something like political alignment. Of course, your question shouldn't be Democrat-Republican. It should maybe be independent involved. Maybe you want to list other parties. Or certainly you should have some other options like I don't wish to disclose or I don't feel strongly either way or I actually relate to both parties on different issues. Let's say there's three or four choices there. And then you want to analyze how that choice meshes up against some other choice, the answer to a specific question. It's quite easy to build the cross-tab to get that data into a spreadsheet and see where your respondents fell out. Now, my recommendation number one is you should normalize that data. If you ask Democrat, Republican, Independent, Independent's going to be the smallest group, almost assuredly, unless it's, you know, a group of independents you're surveying. If you were surveying the general population of the United States, you should get a lot of Democrats, a lot of Republicans, and then some smaller groups. So when you look across the options in whatever question you're cross-tabbing, the raw counts are quite misleading to the average person's eye. You should do a row-wise normalization so that you see the distribution on a scale of 0 to 100% across each of those different groups. If the question is, what do you eat for breakfast, and you have common choices, cereal, eggs, pancakes, etc., it would not surprise me to learn that political alignment and breakfast choices are independent. There's no correlation here. And I find it easiest to see that in a normalized distribution across those groups. Although the one scary part is you could hide a low magnitude result. You know, 50% of people eat eggs, but if there's only four people in that category, that's two people. So you should be doing some sort of test for statistical significance. As with almost every statistical test, you kind of have to examine each situation you're in and determine if it's the right choice. But in my experience, 75% of the time you're going to use the chi-square test. So if you think of those distributions over the breakfast food choices, the null hypothesis is the one I stated, that your political affiliation does not affect what you select for breakfast. And the alternative hypothesis is that it does. Now even that procedure is a little bit tricky. You really should have someone good at stats to go look at it. You can make operator errors if you don't understand the chi-square test pretty well. There's some minimum thresholds and things like that to consider. But at the end of the day, even though I want to apply the rigorous statistical stuff, I don't want to get overly obsessed with that. Garbage in, garbage out. The statistics assume that you have a well-sampled data set. That is almost never true in a survey. So when there's a question like, oh, should we or should we not have applied some correction? I'm always in favor of running the analysis both ways. A standard sort of sensitivity check. If there's a methodological disagreement and disagreeing parties agree on the final result, who cares about the argument? Yet on the flip side, a person with an agenda who wants the survey to say what they want it to say, well, that's the person you defend against using statistics. For example, if you're doing any sort of stratification by groups, maybe you want to ensure that you have a representative population by age and gender and ethnicity, the majority of people who conduct surveys in satisfying that request are going to introduce a selection bias you don't want in your data set. Think about it this way. You open up the survey, you want everyone to take it, and the people who flood in first are the most common demographic groups. For example, in my experience, disproportionately women take online surveys. I don't know why. So if you stratify your sample and you want it representative across genders, 
you'll probably get female responses faster than you get male responses. And when that group fills up, typically you pause it. We got 100 female responses, pause that group, wait for the other quota groups that have other genders to fill up. But in so doing, you've also just manipulated the other groups that are still open. Maybe you have age groups. Younger people take surveys more often. So if you close out the female group, now you're saying on the age distribution, I'm only accepting men into these higher age groups just because it's slower. I don't know if I'm characterizing that well in the audio format. It makes a lot of sense visually. But if you find the point particularly nuanced, well, maybe the lesson is that the survey collection process is nuanced. We apply the statistics where we can, but most of all, we need critical thinking. So whether you're conducting, participating in, or analyzing a survey, think hard about the data you have, how you came by it, and how people will interpret your analysis of it. And I feel like I'm running a little long here, so I'm going to kick it till next week to do analysis of my recent survey about languages. More of a poll, really. It's four or five questions. I want to know about listeners, your programming languages, your spoken languages, and two other quick questions. Head over to survey.dataskeptic.com and please participate in that survey. I'm going to share the results here next week. Between now and then, this has been another installment of Data Skeptic All About Surveys.